Okay, welcome back everyone. It's Cube's coverage here in Las Vegas for Amazon ReMars, Machine Learning Automation Robotics in Space. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Got a great set of guests here talking about AI. Jason Montgomery, CTO and co-founder of Mantium, and Ryan Sevy, CEO, founder. Guys, thanks for coming on. We are just chatting. Lost my train of thought because we were chatting about something else. <laughs> your history um, with Data Robot and, and your backgrounds as entrepreneurs. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for having us. So first, before we get into the conversation, tell me about the company. You guys have a history together, multiple startups, multiple exits. What are you guys working on? Obviously AI is hot here, it's part of the show. M is Mars, machine learning, which we all know is the basis for AI. What's the story? Yeah, really, we're, we're here for two of the letters in Mars. We're here for the machine learning and the automation part. Mm -hmm. So at the high level, Mantium is a no-code AI application development platform. And basically anybody could log in and start making AI applications. It could be anything from just texting it with the Twilio integration to tell you that you're doing great or that you need to exercise more <laughs> to integrating with Zendesk to get support tickets classified. So Jason, we were talking too about, before we came on camera, about the cloud and how you can spin yeah. up resources. The data world is um, coming together and I, and I like to see two flashpoints. The, I call it the 2010 big data era that began and then failed, Hadoop crashed and burned. Yeah. Then out of, the, out of the woodwork came data robots and the data stacks and the snowflakes. Data bricks, snowflake, And yeah. now you have that world coming back at mm -hmm. scale. So we're now seeing a huge era of, I need to stand up infrastructure and platform to do all this heavy lifting I don't have time to do. Right. That sounds like what you guys are doing. Is that kind of the case? That's absolutely correct. Yeah, and typically you would have to hire a whole team. It would take you months to sort of get the infrastructure automation in place, the DevSecOps, DevOps pipelines together. Um, and to do the automation to spin up, spin down, scale up, scale down, requires a lot of special expertise with you know, Kubernetes yeah. and a lot of the other data pipelines uh, and a lot of the AWS technologies. Right, so we so automate a lot of that. So if, it, if DevOps did what they did, infrastructure as code, yeah. data as code, which this is kind of like that, mm -hmm. it's not data ops per se. Is there a category? How do you see this? Because it's, I mean, you could say data ops, but that's also, it's DevOps, DevSecOps, there's a lot going on. Oh, yeah. It's not just saying AI ops. Right. There's a lot more. What, what would you call this? It's a good question. I don't know if we've quite come up with a name. It's I know not data ops. It's not like we call it AI process automation. There you go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's APA it, it, instead of RPA. What <laughs> RPA promised to be. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But what's the challenge? The number one problem is it's. I would say I'm not with, not so much all on heavy on on differentiated heavy lifting. It's a lot of heavy lifting. That for sure. Yes. What's involved? What's the consequences of not going this way? If I want to do it myself, can you take me through the the pros and cons of what the scale, the scope, the scale of without right. you guys. Yeah, historically you needed to, to curate all your data, bring it together in some sort of data lake um, or something like that. And then you had to do really a lot of feature engineering um, and a lot of other sort of data science on the back end and automate the whole thing and deploy it and get it out there. It's a, it's a pretty rigorous and, and challenging problem that you know we've, there's a lot of automation platforms for, but they typically focus on data scientists. Um, with these large language models we're using, they're pre-trained, so you've sort of taken out that whole first step of all that data collection um, to start out, and you can basically start prototyping almost instantly because they've already got like six billion parameters, 10 billion parameters in them. They understand the human language really well and a lot of other problems. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, Ryan, but yeah. I think the <laughs> other part is we deal with a lot of organizations that don't have big IT teams. Yeah and it would be impossible, quite frankly, for them to ever do something like deploy Textract, as an example. Yeah, yeah. They're just not going to do it, yeah. but now they can come to us. They know the problem they want solved. They know that they have all these invoices, as an example, and they want to run it through Textract, and now with us, they can just drag and drop and yeah. say, yeah, we want Textract, and then we want it to go through this, and this and is what we want. Expertise is a huge problem, and the fact that IT's changing, too, right? Yeah. Put yeah. that out there, you guys say, you know, cybersecurity challenges, we guys do have a background in that, so you know all the cutting edge. So this just seems to be this IT, I hate to say transformation, because that's not the word I'm looking for. I'd say stuck in the mud kind of scenario where they can't, they have to get bigger faster. Yeah. And the scale is bigger. And they don't have the people to do it. So you've seen the rise of yeah. managed service. You mentioned Kubernetes. Right. I know this young 21 year old kid, he's got a great business. He runs a managed service yep. for Kubernetes. Why, because no one's there to, Stand up the clusters. Yeah, it's a big gap. So this, you have these sets of services coming in. Now, where, where do you guys fit into that conversation if I'm the customer? I, I, my problem is what? What is, my, what is my problem that I need you guys for? What does it look like? To describe my problem. 
Uh, typically, you actually, you, you kind of know that your employees are spending a lot of time, a lot of hours, so I'll just give you a real example. Yeah. Uh, we have a customer that they were spending 60 hours a week just reviewing these accounts payable invoices. 60 hours a week on that. And they knew there had to be a better way. So Manual review? Manu like, when we got their data, they were showing us these invoices, and they had to have their people circle the total on the invoice, highlight uh -huh. the customer that name. That person quit the next day, right? No, like they, they <laughs> hey, you know, they had four people doing four this, people, I yeah. think. <laughs> and the point is, is they come to us, and we say, well, you know, AI can, can just, basically using something like TextRack can just do this, and then we can enrich those outputs from TextRack with the AI, yeah. so that's where the transformers come in. And when we showed them that, and got them up and running in about 30 minutes, they were mind blown. Yeah. And now this is a company that doesn't have a big IT department, so to but kind they of- they had the ability to quantify the problem. They yes. knew, and, and in this case, it was actually a business user. It was not yeah. a technical- Yeah, there's hours. The consequences, that's wasted manual labor, wasted. Exactly, yeah, and, and to their point, it was, look, we have way more high valuable tasks that our people could be doing yeah. than doing this AP thing that takes six hours. And I think that's really important to remember about AI. We're, I don't think it's going to automate away people's jobs. Yeah. What it's going to do is it's going to free us up to focus on what really matters and focus yeah. on the high value stuff, and that's what people should yeah. be doing. I know it's a cliche, but I'm going to say it again because I keep saying it because I keep saying it for people to listen. The bank teller argument always was the big thing. Oh yeah, yeah. they're going to get killed by the ATM machine. No, they're opening up more branches. That's right. That's right. So yep. it's like, come on people, let's get, get over that. So I, I definitely agree with that. Then the question, next question is, what's your secret sauce? I'm the customer, I'm going to like that value proposition. You make something go away, that's a pain relief. Then there's the growth side. Okay, you can solve some problems. Now I want the, the, uh, the vitamin. Mm -hmm. You got the aspirin, now I want the vitamin. What's the growth angle for you guys with your customers? What's the big learnings once they get the beachhead with problem solving? I think it, 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 it's, the big one is to say that we start with the account payable thing. Mm -hmm. Because it's so, our platform's so approachable, they go in and then they start tinkering with the initial, we'll call it a template. So they might say, hey, you know what, actually in this edge case, I'm going to play with this and not only do I want it to go to our accounting system, but if it's this edge case, I want it to email me. So they'll just drag and drop an email block into our canvas, and now they're making it their so own. So this is the no code, low That's code right. situation. They're essentially building a notification engine under the covers, they have no idea what they're doing. That's but right, they, the they just know that, hey, you know what, when, when like the amount's over $10,000, I want an email. They know that's what they want. They don't. They don't know yeah. that's a notification. Of engine, course, right? that's, that's called value. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I get what I wanted. All right. So <laughs> tell me about the secret sauce. What's under the covers? What's the big, uh, big, big scale valuable, valuable uh, secret sauce? Uh, I would say part of it, and, and honestly, the reason that we're able to do this now, is transformer architecture. When the transformer papers came out, and then of course the attention is all you need paper. Um, those kind of unlocked it and made this all possible. Beyond that, I think. Yeah, the secret sauce is we've been doing this a long time, yeah, yeah, so we yeah. kind of, <laughs> have, we, we know where the pain we points are. We lived through those pain points, because uh, we weren't little... data scientists or ML people. Yeah, we, yeah we, you, had, we, you walked the snow with <laughs> no shoes on in the winter. That's right. <laughs> These kids now got boots on, they're all happy. <laughs> we've installed machines, you've loaded OS's on, on top of our rock switches. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable yes. how awesome it is right now to be a developer, and a, now a business user is doing yeah. the low code. Yep. If you have the system architecture set up, so back to the data engineering side, you guys had the experience, got you here. This is a big discussion right now we're having in, in, on theCUBE and many conversations. Like the server market, you had that go away through Amazon, mm -hmm. and Google was one of the first, obviously, to board. But the idea that servers could be everywhere. So the SRE role came out, the Site Reliability Engineer, right. which was one guy or gal and zillions of servers. Now you're seeing the same kind of role with data engineering. Mm -hmm. And then there's not a lot of people that fit the requirement of being a data engineer. It's like, yeah. it's very unique because you're dealing with a system architecture, not mm -hmm. data science. So you start to see the role of this, this, this new persona because they're taking on all the manual challenges of doing that. You guys have kind of replaced that, I think. Well, do you I mean, agree about the data engineer, first of all? I think, yeah. Well, and it's different because there's, there's an, the older data engineer and then there's sort of the newer cloud aware one mm -hmm. who knows how to use all the cloud technologies. And so, when you're trying, we've tried to hire some of those and it's like, 
okay, you're really familiar with old database technology, but can you orchestrate that in a serverless environment with a lot of AWS technology, for instance, and it's... And that's hard. They don't, they don't, there's not a lot of people who know that yeah. space. So. And there's no real curriculum out there that's going to teach you <coughs> how to handle you know, ETLing and also yeah. like I got, I want to stream data from this source. Right. I'm using SQL, I'm not going to put it yeah. all together. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a it's lot of just data science. It's trying to figure that scripts. out. So with the large language models too, we don't have to worry about some of the data there too. It's, it's already you know, codified in the model. Um, and then as we collect data, as people use our platform, they can then curate data they want to annotate or enrich the model with so that it works better as it goes. So we're kind of curating, collecting the data as it's used, so as it evolves, it just gets better. Well, you guys obviously have a lot of experience together. Congratulations on the venture. Thank you. What's going on here at Remars? Why are you here? What's the pitch? What's the story? Where's your, you got two letters, you got, the, you got the M for the machine learning and AI, and you got the A for automation. What's the ecosystem here for you? What are you doing? Well, I mean, I think you, you kind of said it, right? We're here because of the machine learning and the automation <laughs> part, but uh, more, more widely than that, I mean, we work very, very closely with Amazon on a number of fronts, things like TextTrack, Transcribe, mm -hmm. Alexa. Basically, all these AWS services are just integrations within our system. So you might want to hook up your AI to an Alexa so that you can say, hey, Alexa, tell me Updates about my LinkedIn feed. I don't know. Whatever, whatever yeah. your heart's content. Well, what about this cube transcription? Well, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hundred hey, percent. You know yeah, we could do that. You know, feed all this in there, and then we could do summarization of everything that and was on here. Q and A extraction. And yeah. say, hey, these guys are technical. Right. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Oh, they mentioned Kubernetes. We didn't say serverless. <laughs> Chef, puppet. Those are words, right? You know, <laughs> right. no linguistics matters, right? Yeah, You're getting into the, yeah. and that's a service that no one's ever going to build. Well, and actually, on, on that point, really interesting, we work with some healthcare companies, and when you're, basically, when people call in, and they call into the insurance, they have a question about their, what, like, is this going to be covered? And what they want to key in on are things like, I just went to my doctor and got a cancer diagnosis. So the, the, the relevant thing here is, they just got this diagnosis. And why is that important? Well, because if you just got a diagnosis, they want to start a certain triage to make you successful with your treatments, because obviously there's an incentive yeah, to do that. Time series matters in, in data. Exactly. And yeah. machine learning reacts to it. But also it could be fed back old data. It used to be time series just store it. Yeah. But now you can reuse it to see how to make the machine learning better. Are you guys doing anything, anything around that, how to make the machine learning smarter? Um, look, doing look backs or, mm -hmm. maybe not the right word, but, um, because you have data, I might as well look back at it. That's yep. how it happened. So part of, part of our platform and part of what we do is as people use these applications, to your point, there's lots of data that's getting generated. Well, we capture all that, and that becomes now a labeled data set within our platform, and you can take that labeled data set and do something called fine tuning, which yep. just makes the underlying model more and more Better. yours, it's proprietary the more you do it, and it's more accurate usually the more you do it. So it's yeah, we, we keep you know, all that. I want to ask your reaction on this, it's a good point. The competitive advantage and the intellectual property is going to be the workflows. And so the data is the IP. If this refinement happens, that becomes mm -hmm. intellectual property. Yeah. That's kind of not software, it's the data modeling, it's the data itself yeah. is worth something. Are yep. you guys seeing that? Uh, yeah, and actually how we position the company yeah. is Mantium is a control plane and you retain ownership of the data plane. So it is your intellectual property, yeah. it's in your system, it's in your AWS environment. Wait, that's not what everyone else is doing, everyone else wants to be the control plane and the data plane. We don't want to own your yep. data. We don't. It's a yeah. compliance and security nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> Let's <laughs> be like real. the question, yeah. what do you optimize for? <clears throat> right. And I think that's a, fa a fair bet given the fact that clients want to be more agile with their data anyway, yeah. and the more restrictions you put on them, why would that, this only gets you in trouble. Yeah. I can see that being, a, and plus lock in is going to be a huge factor. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this is coming fast, and no one's talking about it in the press, but everyone's like, run to silos, be a silo, and that's not how data works. No. So the question <laughs> is, how do you create siloing of data for, say, domain specific applications while maintaining a horizontally scalable data plane or control plane? That seems to be kind of disconnected. Everyone wants to lock in their data. What do you guys think about that? 
this industry transition we're in now because it seems people are reverting back to fourth grade, right? <laughs> and to, you know, back to silos. Yeah, I think, well, I think the companies probably want their silo of data, their IP, and so as they uh, refine their models and, and we give them the ability to deploy it in their own SageMaker, in their own VPC, they, they retain and own it. They can actually get rid of us and they still have that model. Now they may have to build, you know, a lot of pipelines and other technology to support it, but. Well, your lock-in is usability. Exactly. And value. Yeah. Value proposition is the lock-in. Bingo. that's not counterintuitive. <laughs> exactly, you yeah. You say, hey, more value, <laughs> well, I want to get rid of it. It's valuable, I'll pay for it. Right. As long as you have multiple values, step up, and that's what cloud does. I mean, I think that's the thing about cloud that's going to make all this work, in my opinion. The value enablement is much higher. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, good business model. Um, anything else here at the show you observed that you like, that you think people would be interested in? What's the most important story coming out of the, the holistic, if you zoom up and look at Remars, what's, what's coming out of the vibe? You know, one thing that I think about a lot is we're, you know, we have Artemis here, humanity hopefully is soon going to be going to Mars, and I think that's really, really exciting. And I also think when we go to Mars, we're probably not going to send a bunch of software engineers up there, <laughs> right? So we got like, robots to do break fix now, so you know we're good. <laughs> right? IT's gone, so <laughs> right? services are going to be easy. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I, oh, I, I left that device back at Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I just <laughs> think that's not going to be good. Just replicate yeah, it. Yeah, and, and, and what? I think there's like an eight minute. Amazon's going to have the, the first monopoly on uh, next day delivery in space. <laughs> <laughs> They'll just have a spaceship that sends out drones to Mars. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that when we start going back to the moon and we go to Mars, yes. people are going to think, hey, I need this application yeah. now to solve this problem that I didn't anticipate having. And in science fiction, we kind of saw this with like how, right? Like you have this yeah. AI on this computer or this on this spaceship that could do all this stuff. We need that. And I haven't seen that here yet. No, it's not here and, yet. And it's I think right that's now, going I need to, to get the hardware right first. Yep but we did a lot of reporting on this with the DOD and the Tactile Edge, mm -hmm. you know, military applications. It's a fundamental, I won't say, it's a tech religious argument. Like, do you believe in agile, real-time data, or do you believe in dem democratizing multi-vendor, you know, uh, capability? I think, I think the industry needs to sort itself out because sometimes multi-vendor, multi-cloud might not work for an application that needs this database or this mm -hmm. application at the edge. Right. Yeah. So if you're in space, the backhaul, it matters. It really does, I mean, yeah. yeah. Not a good time to go back and get that highly available data. Wait a minute, highly, <laughs> is it highly available or? High, there's two terms. Highly available, which means real time, and uh, available. Yeah. Available means it's on a disk. Right. Yeah. So that's a big challenge. Well, guys, thanks for coming on. Sure. Quick plug for the company. What are you guys up to? How much funding do you have? How old are you? Staff, hiring? What's yeah, some of the details? We're about 45 people right now. We are a globally distributed team, so we hire every, like from every country pretty much. <laughs> uh, we are fully remote, so if you're looking for that, hit us up. Definitely always look for engineers, looking for more data scientists. Uh, we're very, very well funded as well. Good. And yeah, so Where hopefully check us out. Where are you guys headquartered? Uh, so a lot of us live in Columbus, Ohio. That's technically the HQ, <laughs> but like I said, we're, we're yeah. in pretty much every continent except in Antarctica. So you're all virtual? Yeah, 100% virtual. 100%. Yep. Got it. Well, congratulations, and uh, love to hear that data dog story at the time. Uh, or data robot, yeah. I mean, data, data robot, sorry. Let's get, <laughs> get all confused, data dog. Too many data coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming on, and congratulations for your success, and thanks for sharing. Awesome. Yeah, thanks yeah, for having thanks us. For having Pleasure to be here. It's theCUBE here at Rebars, I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching. More coming back after this short break. <laughs>